school my kids these days because we're all in lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, having two girls at home, I hear is much less of a headache than having two boys at home because I hear they're, they are oddly mad. So James, how are you? It's been a while. I think we're now, now broadcast to the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just showed all the participants my baby. Okay. No, all the participants <laughs> is CEO baby. This is great news. Congratulations, Eddie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we can start in like one minute if everyone's ready. Yes, I'm ready. Lena, you on the line? Yes, yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, let me see. Ru, how many have? Can you see the participants? Yeah, uh, we have fifty nine, sixty right now. Okay, cool. I think we can start. I can start now. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I hope. Everyone is all safe and well with your loved ones. Uh, my name is Chong. Uh, I'm an MPA student at Columbia University and part of the VFS Executive Committee. I'm going to be the moderator for today. Um, the topic of discussion is impact investing in Vietnam, uh, which is a fairly new topic to general audience. And we are very happy to have with us a very experienced panel who will, we will introduce shortly. Um, before starting the webinar, we let me, I just want to go through a few housekeeping rules for the event. Um, all attendees for the webinar will be muted after joining. You cannot share your camera and can only share the camera with the host. Um, and you can only see camera from the host and speakers. To ask speakers any questions, please click the Q&A button. You can ask any anonymously by ticking send anonymously before hitting the send button. The Q and A button is next to the chat button, um, and we we'll all we will go over the most important questions in the Q and A section. If you want to speak to the speakers directly, uh, you can please hit raise hand. Uh, the raise hand button is on the left of the chat button. If you are using Zoom app on your phone, and it's on the right of the chat button. If you're using Zoom on your desktop, the chat button allows you to chat with the panelists directly or to everyone on the webinar. Please do not ask questions through chat because there is a high chance that speakers may not be able to see your questions. Um, and now I just want to pass the mic to Wu Chen, co-president of BFS, to give a brief introduction about our society. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chan. I'm gonna make it real quick. Uh, my name is Wu Chen, investment banking analyst at Macquarie, co-founder of Vietnam Finance Society. Thank you so much for joining our in our, our webinar, this is the first time we've done it. Uh, historically, our events have been just mostly physical events in New York, but uh, thanks to COVID-19, we are exploring uh, new avenues. Uh, if you've been following us since the founding, we organize a number of networking, professional development events for Vietnamese professionals, mostly around three constituents, Vietnamese students, young professionals and executives. And uh, the goal is just to support empower and sponsor Vietnamese professionals. And we see that there's a real need for that, given that countries on the, on the rise and there's a growing number of professionals that we definitely looking at career, uh, career finance society or the, Chi uh, the Chinese or Indian, definitely they have a more well-organized uh, society uh, compared to us uh, when it comes to finance professionals. So um, we're mostly based in New York, but uh, expanding our physical presence in Singapore and uh, want to expand globally to a webinar series as well. Uh, if you're also, Definitely, if you like it, don't like it, uh, feel free to reach out. If you want to join, you have any ideas on uh, what the next webinar should be, uh, let us know. Uh, so traditionally, our events have been in person and very interactive, so we hope to do the same through Zoom. Uh, so uh, throughout the webinar, we're going to have Q uh, uh, just like moderate questions, but in the Q&A session, uh, I can allow like folks to kind of like talk uh, on, on Zoom. So raise your hand, let us know. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Ru, for the introductions. So moving on to our panelists. Thank you, Eddie, Lynn, Louis, and Shuin for joining us today. Um, I would let you introduce yourself. Uh, Louis, do you want to kick us off? And then following by Lynn, Shuin, and Eddie. Great. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Louis Nguyen. I am the Chief Investment Officer of, uh, at Mission Driven Finance, which is an impact investing firm based out of San Diego. Uh, our firm focused primarily uh, in the U.S. for our impact investing. Um, so I wear another hat, which is as a, a uh, private investor. Um, been investing in Vietnam for some 20 years. Um, and some uh, impact investing uh, opportunities there as well as non-impact investing. Um, and so uh, we define impact in a variety of different ways and we'll get that into that in, I guess, in a little bit. Um, but uh, very happy to be here and appreciate the, uh, the invite. Hi, I think I'm next. I'm Lin Nguyen. Um, I uh, manage the private equity program for the U.S. government. It's um, called the U.S. Um, International Development Finance Corporation. Um, we're a development finance entity similar to the IFC or, you know, CDC of the U.K. or FMO or, you know, one of the um, um, 20 or so development financial institutions. Um, we have about 60 billion in capital capacity. Um, a third of that is, um, you know, dedicated to the investment funds program, which is where I sit. We have a very small team of about 12 people. So we invest only in emerging markets and really focusing on low uh, income to low middle income countries. Um, a third of our portfolios in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I would say probably 25 to 30% or so is in Asia. And the rest uh, is spread uh, spread out between um, Eastern Europe as well as LATAM and really focusing on Central America um, and Mexico. Um, we, you know, in our history, uh, the funds program has been around for about 35 or so years. Um, you know, we do very small deals to very large deals. Um, mainly we invest in growth equity funds. Uh, recently, we've looked at VC funds, so I, I know Eddie quite well because we've, you know, discussed VCs in Asia and as well as VC in the, the Middle East and other parts of the world. Um, impact investing for us, I mean, we had originally always thought that we did impact investing, but, um, you know, in the more recent decade and in the more recent years, we, we, we realized that, you know, it's, an, it's the intentionality aspect of impact investing that that really counts and so uh, we are doing more and more in impact investment and um, you know we can talk a little bit about how DFC does it um, you may or you may not know that DFC just recently became the DFC it used to be the overseas private investment corporation um, and so um, with the new mandate um, and a new statute for DFC we basically added equity authority and grant funding and technical assistant uh, funding to our uh, set of tools. And so uh, very exciting times. And I know we'll get into this topic later, uh, COVID-19 and the impact and the fallout uh, of COVID-19, especially in our markets and especially in, you know, the, the, the poorest countries. And so we can, um, you know, go over what we're trying to do to help out. Great. Um, thanks, Lynn. Hi, I think I'm next. I'm Shu Yin Tang. I'm a partner at Panama Capital. Um, we're an impact investing firm um, which invests across Southeast Asia as well as South Asia. Um, so I've been living and working in Vietnam for, for eight years um, and, and lead our Ho Chi Minh City office. Um, so we basically take a venture capital approach, um, investing in companies which are having a positive impact on, um, on low income and low to middle income communities in, in the region. Uh, we have offices in Ho Chi Minh City, in Jakarta, in Manila, um, in Singapore, in Colombo and Bangalore, as well as kind of our, our kind of legacy office in, in San Francisco. Um, so we've been investing in the region for, for 10 years. Um, have uh, made investments in Vietnam, such as, you know, Topica, as well as Zupiek, um, and yeah, we'll be happy to share our thoughts on, on impact investing um, and in, in Vietnam and, and the broader Southeast Asia region on this call. Thank you. Cool, and uh, I'm Eddie Tai. I'm a partner with 500 Startups. We are a, a traditional global venture capital firm uh, headquartered in San Francisco, but with presence in a couple dozen markets around the world. Uh, we have been in recent years the most active venture capital firm uh, globally by deal count. 
uh, that's partially because it's uh, easy for us. Our strategy is lots of little bits. We invest in the seed stage in uh, technology or tech enabled businesses uh, wherever we see a lot of potential. Uh, I uh, joined 500 Startups uh, along with my partner, Ben, about five years ago. Uh, and uh, we have uh, since set up a venture capital fund uh, focus within 500 focused specifically in Vietnam. Uh, and in the last few years, we've also been the most active uh, VC investor here in Vietnam by deal count. Um, we now have about 60 companies in our portfolio. Although we're a traditional firm globally, I personally have a lot of interest in impact uh, and that reflects in our portfolio. We have about a dozen companies that uh, I would cast, classify as uh, impact focused. And we'll talk more about that later, I, I suppose. I've been here in Vietnam in Saigon since 2012. Thank you so much for your introductions. Um, just want to kick off the conversation. Uh, it might be helpful to understand the definition of impact investing for in, in the interest of the audience. So impact investment as defined by Global Impact Investing Network are uh, investment made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. There is a lot of debates going on in the industries regarding the definition of the impact. Um, Lin, maybe we can start with you. How does your organization define impact and how this drives your investment strategies? Yeah, so in general, um, I think all of our work, the work that we do and the capital investments that we've made around the world over the last, I guess, 50 years, um, our portfolio is now about, I guess, 24 billion plus. Um, we've we've always thought that our all of our you know investments were highly developmental and were impactful. And the way we used to measure that is you know job creation, um, increase in revenue to the local communities, right? Tax revenues. Um, and so it was pretty simple in the early days of OPIC. Um, but in the recent decade or so, we started looking at, you know, what is impact? And there were a lot of confusion, I think, in the market. Everybody defines it differently. Um, but I think um, more and more in recent years, it's really narrowed down to, you know, what is the intention of the investment? And this is what we ask our fund managers. Like, you know, what are you targeting in the strategy? And how do you measure the impact that you have, whether it's, you know, climate change, but, right, uh, reduction in CO2, uh, whether it's helping women, lifting women out of poverty. So, you know, the SDG, I, 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 think, I, I think women is five, like SDG five. So how do you measure that? And really getting into the granular and very detailed level of you know what is the purpose, what is the intention, what metrics do you use to measure whether you've achieved that, um, and how do you report, and how do you monitor, and how do you ensure that you're meeting those objectives? And so for me, from a funds perspective, right, because this is where I sit, we invest in private equity funds. Our impact funds are large and small. I think there is a misunderstanding that you know, only very tiny high risk funds in frontier markets are impactful. That is not accurate 100%. There are larger funds who have intention to achieve, you know, a certain objective, whether they're one of the SDGs or something with respect to the environment or, you know, ENS that are large that have an intention, that have metrics that they measure, that monitor and that improve and that can show in their reporting that they've achieved these metrics or these objectives. Um, you know, those funds are impactful as well as the little funds that we support, uh, the little funds being under $100 million in total capitalization. And so for, for us, we try to um, make sure that the manager or the investee stays true to, you know, the mandate, like the investment thesis, have a, you know, system of measurement and monitor and report and show improvement. Now, in our markets, um, you know, we have all the other development financial institutions. And one of the confusing things 
Um, and I know this is still confusing even today and, you know, with, you know, two decades of impact investing under all of our belts is the framework and the metrics, you know, each of us use. There are significant overlaps, but because everyone uses a different system, measures things a different way and report a different way, and there's not really harmonization I know the gin and, you know, the various NGOs and all these associations try to harmonize and they've done a wonderful job, but there's still, you know, not a one set system of what is impact, um, how does one measure it? And then you throw into that, you know, different sectors have different metrics, right? So in energy, you measure megawatt, you measure uh, CO2, you measure like different metrics, um, you know, in hospitals, you measure beds, you measure, uh, you know, reduction in certain illnesses, et cetera. And so it, it's, it's, it's really like very complex, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, there is convergence on, you know, certain sectors. And I think the IFC has done significant work. The IFC is the International Finance Corporation. It's a subsidiary of the World Bank. They've done significant work in harmonizing a lot of the measurements, and they break it down by uh, by industry and by sectors. We work very closely with all of these entities uh, from a DSC perspective. Um, you know, we measure impact uh, through three pillars: so innovation. So is the project innovative in the way that it's structured, uh, that it is structured, or innovative in a way that you know, once um, it's a business idea that if it can scale, it can be replicable across a broad market. So that's innovation. Uh, we measure inclusion. Inclusion is, you know, um, you know, does the project or does the investment promote women or, you know, the lowest and the poorest um, income populations? Does it reach into the hinterlands of, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or, or, you know, does it go into places like Myanmar where there's, you know, a dearth of capital? Um, and then we measure economic growth. And that's, you know, what people understand the most. Um, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, does the investment uh, create uh, revenues for a country? Does does the investment create market, you know, develop a market so that it, uh, it, 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 uh, it attracts some other, you know, commercial investors who would have not otherwise come in. And so, you know, we, we have broad strokes and then we have sort of the granular detail uh, metrics and measurements that we require of, uh, you know, our investee or companies into which we put our capital. And so, um, you know, I'm 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 pretty sure that um, um, Eddie and Sri Yan um, and Louis will have their own version of what they believe is, or you know, what their firm believe, um, you know, is impact investing. And um, you know, I'm not sure if your audience know, but we are invested in Patamar, which Sri Ying, um, and so hopefully Sri Ying can tell us. Um, you know, how she does impact and, um, you know, her interactions with uh, the DFC and, and, and what we're expected, uh, uh, you know, Patamar to report on in terms of metrics and, um, and, how, and in terms of monitoring not only the ENS, but the, you know, different areas that uh, Patamar wishes to make a difference. Yep. Thanks, Lynn, for that is a very comprehensive overview of what's going on. Um, Maybe Shuin, if you want to follow up on, yeah, what? I can, I can, yeah, yeah certainly touch on some, some key points there. Um, I think Lynn gave such a great overview of you know just the definitions and kind of where the field is is right now. Um, yeah, I, I really like the the Jin definition actually that that you first read out, Chang. Um, I think it captures I think two really important aspects for me. I think the first is still that intentionality piece, which which Lynn mentioned. Um, it's you know how do you set your intentions? How do you define um, the the fund's goals? Because it, it will be different, right? I mean, as as Lynn mentioned, I mean some firms focus on you know climate change, and you know for us we're focused more on kind of economic impact, right, and economic growth. Um, and then I think the second piece is, is the kind of the measurable in that definition, right? A measurable social or environmental um, return. And I think, you know, Lynn also got into some of the nuances and, um, 
and, and, and challenges sometimes with reporting that impact. Um, maybe I'll, I'll share from a fund manager's point of view, you know, like exactly how, how we do it, right, as, as an example to make it um, very tangible um, for, for those on the call. Um, you know, so for us, as I mentioned, you know, we define um, or we, our goal in, in terms of impact is having, you know, a positive impact on the economic prospects of low and middle income communities um, in the countries where we operate, so Southeast Asia and, um, and South Asia. And, you know, I think often we get asked, like, oh, you know, what's the specific, like, dollar per day cutoff, right, in terms of the earnings of, of these, you know, how do you define low and middle income communities? And, like I, I have to say, right? I think it's it's very contextual, right? It's, it's um, you know, I think often people looking like, okay, what's the one metric you could measure, or what's the one you know bar that you can set? I actually think you know it, it really comes, at least in our case, I think we found it comes down to having people on the ground who really understand um, you know these these communities and contexts where we invest, right? And and define, okay, what does kind of underserved look like in this context, right? What do marginalized groups or underserved communities look like, right? And then you know. Uh, what does it mean to provide them with better access to whether it's healthcare or education and, and so forth? Um, so I think that's that's the way we think about it. You know, how do we pro provide these underserved communities um, with with better access to you know essential you know goods and services which improve their lives? Um, we quantify that on on two dimensions, um, and I think it's, it's there's no rocket science here. I have to say, one is the breadth, and one is the depth of the impact. Right. So breadth is in terms of the number of lives directly touched by by the companies that we invest in, and in terms of the depth, we're really looking at you know how can we like quantify the, the economic impact um, on um, on these uh, whether it's you know suppliers, customers, people um, touched. Um, by, by the intervention. And I think the easiest way to do that, of course, is through, um, you know, an increase in, in income. Um, I think that's the, you know, for example, you know, how much can a farmer increase his or her income um, by, by selling to this, this company versus through the, 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 you know, array of middlemen out there. Um, I think that's obviously a, an easy case. Um, I think other times we might have to quantify it more in terms of, you know, cost savings or time savings or, you know, having, um, you know, easier, easier access, right? So it's, it's not quite so clean cut. Um, but I think whatever, you know, whatever way we slice or dice it, we really try and boil it down to, um, you know, to, to a particular quantifiable economic impact um, on, on, on these communities. Um, I have to say that we, we use the IRIS Plus tool by the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, very actively. Um, I think it's actually a great tool, um, you know, to, to really help think through the, the impact. Um, they've really tried to you know, provide different, I guess, um, frameworks and kind of sets of tools uh, within different sectors, right? So I think if you actually, you know, if you go into to like healthcare, right, it actually says like, okay, you're investing in healthcare, how can you think about your healthcare investments and measuring the impact there? If you're investing in women's economic empowerment, right, how do you actually think about, um, you know, uh, improved gender outcomes in, in a kind of systematic way? So I think they've done a great job in actually um, you know, helping us identify like what are the right metrics to be to be measuring right for each sector, um, and you know, and not kind of just leaving it to, to the investment manager to, to you know try and try and figure it out themselves. So, um, I would say while yes, there's still some further work to be done. I think we're definitely moving towards kind of alignment and convergence um, in the impact investing sector, and it certainly can't be used as an excuse. I think some people say like, oh, you know, let's not do impact investing because it's too hard to measure. I, I don't think that excuse is, is really that acceptable anymore. I think we've made incredible process, uh, progress over the past, um, past several years and decades even. Thanks, Shireen. Um, I guess uh, just questions to Louis. So you are in impact investors, uh, invest in the US, you also look at impact investment as a individual investors in um, in Vietnam. How do you divide? Uh, how do you define impact, given your two hats? Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. So I'll speak a little bit about um, my first hat, which is as a fund manager for mission driven finance. We're uh, uh, a debt fund focus on uh, nonprofits as well as for profits doing good in the community. I echo everything that Lynn and Sujin has, has said. Um, I'm, so I'm going to give some explicit examples that can kind of sort of uh, get a little more granular. So uh, there's an organ, a nonprofit here in San Diego. They teach uh, underserved kids how to play squash, the sport, because there are a lot of unclaimed scholarships uh, at universities. Uh, and so these children come, these kids come from broken families. 
they are trained how to play squash to be competitive on a national level. And then they go and claim on uh, these, these scholarships. And so in the last six years or so, they've claimed about $7 million of scholarships for these immigrants and refugees and sort of fam kids from broken families. So this organization wanted to build their own facility in the community that they serve, because now they have to drive quite far to, to, to train these kids. It was a $12 million transaction. We stepped in for $400,000 of debt to close that capital gap that triggered $12 million of uh, funding that got that facility to, to be built. And so that is a key part of what I think is very important is closing that capital gap. The reality is traditional assets, there's tremendous amount of traditional capital. In terms of the impact capital, there's, there is, it's growing and it's quite large, but the reality is it's not as large as that of the traditional capital set. And so when we look at transaction, it's very important for us to ask the question of, are we closing a capital gap? Are we catalytic in a way that triggers real meaningful dollars to come? And the other element that's quite important is capacity building. Like, what am I, when I step into this transaction, am I building this way and in a way there's, there's an additionality and capacity building that did not exist before I showed up, before my, my people and my team showed up? So those are really important questions for us. As it relates to Vietnam, I wear uh, my private investor hat, which is I find transactions in Vietnam that I, it, I think impact is very personal. I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You can intellectualize it, but it's really very personal. And so when I do investments in Vietnam on the impact side, I find transactions that I like. I find a couple of wealthy friends and associates and we put dollars together and then we go in and make the transaction. And so we are not a fund manager. We are a private group of people who have been blessed with some capacity and some capital and and so one of the deals that we did um, is we invested a modest low seven figure amount uh, into a film company in Vietnam. And so it may at times seems a little odd to think that that is an impact, but there are two things that happens there. There's a job creation and there's, and there's technology transfer. Um, so this uh, film company uh, employees, when we stepped in, uh, maybe 90 people, we're at a, a, up to 150 people. Uh, we're one of the largest studios in Vietnam. We're the producer of Am La Banoi Ko An, we made Siu Nha Nhat, we made Thang Nam Ruk Ra. And so those are, those are our films, some of you may recognize it. And so when, before we stepped in to make this investment, Anytime that Vietnam wanted to use this really expensive camera, it's called Phantom Camera, it's half a million dollars. They would have to rent it from a guy in Manila and he would send the camera over with three people, three operators. They would use it for a week and they would take it back. There was zero technology transfer. No one in Vietnam knew how to use it. They knew what it can do, but they didn't know how to use it because they could never use it. And so when we stepped in, one of the first things we did, we, we, we bought one for Vietnam. It was, our, it, was our first, it was our first deployment of capital. So there was some of the What's that? Is that HK Film? That's right, it's HK, HK yeah. Film. Um, and so uh, the camera became um, highly used. The, a cottage industry sprung up around how to manage it, how to clean it, how to maintain it. Uh, now you have technology transfer. Um, and the, so that's capacity building. And so one of the other things we did was to really invest in our own in-house uh, intellectual property or intellectual capability to write scripts and to really work on scripts. Um, and so then we were about a year, two years into that when CJ Entertainment, Korea's large entertainment conglomerate, uh, approached us to do a joint venture uh, to create CJ HK. And that trigger uh, a capital gap, right? So that 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 brought in more capital into the industry, which was prior to us very fragmented. Um, and so, from a very personal base and a very sort of um, because I don't have to report to investors in the same way that the fund managers do, and I deeply appreciate how how intellectual it gets because I have to do that with mission driven finance in San Diego. 
but when it comes, so as, as it relates to sort of deploying capital in Vietnam, those are the questions that I ask for myself is, is there job creation? Is there capacity building? Am I doing something that will trigger really big dollars from people with big deep pockets like Eddie and Shujin and Lynn to come into that space that was not being looked at before, right? So there's no point in me going into uh, renewable energy uh, because there's a lot of money into that space already, right? Unless it's a really sort of interesting technology no one's backing, then we'll look at it. But those are always the question that we have to, that I ask and, I, and, and that's personal to me is, how am, I, how am I closing that capital gap so that larger players and more traditional capital players uh, will want to come in after, after I've been involved? Thanks, Louis. Uh, that's very interesting, especially about the point of closing the capital gap. Um, so we have Eddie next. Um, this question is for you. You might resonate um, quite a bit with Louis' answer about his personal motivations. 500 Startup is a more traditional VC fund, but the fact that you're here clearly shows your interest in making it back to your investment. <clears throat> Could you talk a bit more about your motivation, maybe personal motivations to look more closely at impact investments? Sure, uh, absolutely. So uh, firstly, Louis mentioned a couple interesting things. Uh, I'm, I used to work at CJ uh, here in Vietnam. So I met HK Film about seven, eight years ago when we were first starting to look at that partnership. Uh, so <laughs> small world able to see that. It, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So 500 startups definitely is uh, not a, a social impact firm itself. Uh, we have a broad array of LPs, limited partners uh, that are investors in our funds that uh, are looking for returns. And so that is uh, what we prioritize uh, officially. But the reason why I joined 500 startups was because there is a, a kind of culture of wanting to make an impact. And uh, I'll get to that in a moment. My personal interest uh, is very personal. My, uh, very briefly on my family's history, like many other folks here, uh, came from modest means. My grandfather was an orphan at age 12, uh, alone in the Mekong Delta. Uh, he ended up you know, becoming, uh, getting a small plot of land after helping some other folks. And uh, it, uh, he, was, he was a rice farmer and so on. And through hard work and through help from different um, financing sources. Uh, he was able to fund my father to be the first in the family to go to college here in Vietnam uh, and on and on till I got a very, like, very traditional American upbringing. Uh, so, you know, uh, putting my opportunities and, and personal experience up till now uh, in the context of where we were uh, just a couple generations ago makes me deeply appreciative of um, the help that was given to my family along the way and makes me feel obligated to um, kind of do the same for other people. So that's, that's really the personal motivation. Um, I joined 500 Startups because yes, we wanna maximize returns, uh, but our mission is to promote entrepreneurship and innovation in all its forms everywhere in the world. A lot of venture firms, especially in San Francisco, they just stay in that 20 mile radius of Silicon Valley and talk to teams that are around there. Um, not many, Patamar is one of the few, but not many others. Uh, go out into places that are, are, are less looked at to find entrepreneurs solving the problems for the local communities local, uh, uh, around them. And 500 is, has been doing that for a while. We've invested in more than 70 countries around the world in the last 10 years. So uh, that is, that's why I joined 500. Uh, we ended up raising a fund uh, for Vietnam at a time when the Vietnam story was very much seen with skepticism on the tech side. Um, a few venture firms had been established here more than 10 years ago. Uh, their returns were uh, not what folks had expected. So by the time we were raising a new fund, uh, there was a fair amount of skepticism. There was a, a large capital gap uh, existing uh, and, and not a lot of interest in dedicating a, a specific vehicle to Vietnam. So in setting, setting up this fund, it's only $14 million. So well within Lynn's range of a tiny fund. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been able to go a long way. Uh, we've been able to provide finance quickly to different entrepreneurs. And um, you know, the reason why we didn't emphasize, we, we didn't specify as uh, an impact fund was basically to get capital from folks who, a broader array of folks uh, who, you know, uh, otherwise may not have had a specific interest in backing an impact fund focused on Vietnam at the time. Um, 
Uh, so out of the 60 companies we've invested in, a, lot, a number of them I, I would not classify as impactful. They're very conventional or even as, as anti-impactful, I guess, as a luxury e-commerce website. But um, uh, just by nature of investing in a place like Vietnam, where a large portion of the population, a large portion of the country is still very much developing, still very much emerging, uh, we naturally come across all kinds of opportunities. Uh, our firm in terms of impact, focus on kind of four SDGs. Uh, education, which is always easy to talk about. Uh, economic growth and the future of work, which Shuyin mentioned. Uh, industry and infrastructure. And then of course, sustainable cities and communities. Uh, so out of those four, uh, we've been able to find uh, so far a dozen companies we've wanted to invest in. And um, in fact, our, what I've classified as impact, um, companies are, are doing substantially better than our conventional startups so far. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll pause there on, on that. And the, uh, I guess the last comment is on the measurement. We don't, as we're not an impact investor by definition, we have no obligations to report impact at a, at a portfolio level. Uh, but we do uh, incorporate <coughs> some aspects of it in the, uh, in, in determining whether to invest in a company. Uh, and we, it's very simple. We we'll just look at one metric that, that matters and we, we do a different metric for each company. Uh, and uh, we don't wanna spend a lot of time really like doing the academic exercise of, of really saying, okay, what's the marginal impact in dollar terms for the, for the direct um, recipients? Uh, what's the indirect impact and so on? There is value to that, but our tickets are only $100,000. So at the end of the day, we wanna move pretty quickly. Uh, one, to, for, to be very specific, one example, uh, we talk about it often, so Shuyin will know what company I'm about to bring up, but um, there's a company called Trusting Social, <laughs> which we've invested in a few years ago. It uh, develops, has developed an alternative credit score for the unbanked and underbanked. Uh, so for people who don't have a, a history of formal banking activity, how do you give them, uh, uh, assess their credit? Without an assessment of credit, they have to rely on non-traditional finance, uh, which can be very extractive in terms of terms. Uh, this company, Trusting Social, has uh, used mobile data and lender data to create this score that anybody with a mobile phone can have. And they, in the last few years, have now scored more than 500 million accounts in not just Vietnam, but Indonesia, India, they're expanding to the Philippines and so on. So, um, you know, we did, we, to me, as Louis said, that's very contextual. All, I think all of you said impact is very contextual. Um, I, I think when I looked at this, I saw the story of my grandfather and my father, and I'm like, okay, obviously this is gonna have an impact um, if they succeed. And so we, we wrote a quick check in there. So that's, that's kind of our approach. Uh, with a subsequent fund with larger tickets, we should do a little more rigor, but uh, for us, velocity of money is more valuable uh, than uh, at, at our small tickets than, than tripping ourselves up over measurement too much. Yep. Thanks, Eddie. That's yep. a great answer. So I guess just touching upon, um, Eddie, you mentioned you made a comparison between the more impact uh, companies that you invest in and the non-impact one that you talk about. So I guess this question is for all the panelists. Um, what do you think when people say impact investors have to sacrifice financial returns in order to make social impact? What is your view on this? Um, maybe Shuin, you can start? Or... Yeah, happy to. Um, well, I think as it's often said, right, you know, impact investing, it's, it's a spectrum, right? And I think on one end of the spectrum is a part, you know, is an area where you can actually generate risk, you know, adjusted um, commercial rates of return um, and have have you know impact right defined as, as as your firm kind of defines it right so I think it's definitely possible you don't have to sacrifice um, financial return to to have an impact but I think there are many other parts of the spectrum right the entire middle part of the spectrum where yes you would be looking at a concessional rate of return to um, uh, to to actually have have an impact right I, I don't think it's possible to um, necessarily reach, say, the most um, underserved communities to reach the most marginalized um, groups, right? Whether that's, you know, people in very remote areas of Vietnam, whether it's, um, 
you know, say people with disabilities, ethnic minorities, I mean, people who have been really severely disadvantaged by, by the system, right, and still achieved like a, you know, 20% plus IRR, right? I, I just don't think that's, um, that's, uh, that, 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 that's very feasible. Can you achieve, you know, a 20% plus IRR through doing impact investing? Yes, absolutely, right? Um, there's certain strategies for doing that, but I think that depends on, you know, your fund's mandate, how you've defined what, what you're setting out to achieve. And I think, um, as, as a sense check, like when I'm thinking about different kind of investment strategies, I'm always assessing like, okay, you know, does the, does the impact goal, is it clearly defined? And is their financial goal clearly defined? Or do they actually make sense, right? Alongside each other. Um, because I think certain financial goals are incompatible with certain impact goals, right? Um, and I think as we try and, uh, you, know, um, you know, add some discipline in, in our industry, I think it's an important thing to, to, to consider and hold ourselves accountable. I think Louis has a point <laughs> that he wants to add. Yeah, just fantastic points, Eugene. I wanted to, I think when you first approach that question or when, when that question asks, it's, you got to start out with what, what asset class are you talking about, right? Is it, is it debt? Is it equity? Is it venture? And there are a lot of foundations who are willing to be catalytic, where they want to be concessionary, where they want to be first loss reserve. They want to be first one in so that it, it closes that capital gap for other investors to step in. So the answer to that question, assuming what the capital, whatever your asset class is, uh, I would strongly agree and, and argue that you do not have to give up returns. Um, and one, two points that I think is really important here for me personally is there are, um, there are a lot of businesses out there that is impactful, but if you go up to the entrepreneurs and say, do you realize you're an impact company? And they're like, no, I just provide childcare. I don't, uh, this is, I do something because the community needs it, but they didn't start out thinking to themselves, I want to be an impact firm and this is what I'm going to do. Or someone who runs a rice farm or a coffee plantation and employs hundreds of people in that community, gives them great jobs, give them great training because that person has good compassion and they, that person cares about the community. If you go up to that person and you go up to that woman who owns it and says, do you know you have an impact investment firm? They're like, no, I just do it because I care about my community. And so from my standpoint, that's the kind of companies that I actually look for. I think there's, there's incredible need for people like Eddie and Shujin and, and on a much larger scale, what Lynn is doing. But I also look for just whole economy, brick and mortar, where they make good money, good cash flow, and they add something meaningful to their, to their community and for whatever reason they need capital because they're expanding to a second location or whatever it is, if I see that as some community could use, whether it's an English school, or whether it's early childhood education, or maybe it's just creating jobs, that to me are investments that can return well for the risk that I'm incurring. Again, it's the asset class that you're, you're putting yourself, that you're, you're, you're deploying so in answer to that specific question, I think generally people have thought that you have to give up on return to do good. I think in this sort of new wave of impact opportunities, I would argue that you wouldn't have to. Um, and Lynn, since you have experience with emerging market all over the world, just a follow-up question. What would you see as a risk and returns prospects of impact funds in these markets? Okay, so for us, the very, very big question is scale. So in order to make a difference, because the SDGs, you know, there is a lack of capital going into the SDGs, I think it's trillions of dollars, you know, it's not even hundreds of billions, it's like trillions of dollars to solve all of these development type issues, right, from, you know, women to, uh, you know, low income populations to healthcare to pandemic, like the one that we're going through right now, we're all on lockdown. Um, to, you know, reducing access to, you know, telecommunication, financial services. I mean, there's just a whole host of developmental challenges that we all try to solve. And in order to solve these, the government, like ourselves, and, you know, the ISC and all the other entities, we can't do it because there's not enough capital. We need the private sector. The private sector um, players 
most of them, right, the pension funds, the family offices. I mean, leaving aside the, you know, the impact investors who, you know, do have a trade-off, you know, between risk and uh, risk and returns, and are catalytic, uh, you know, per Louis description and uh, I think somebody else talked about catalytic capital too. You know, there's a role for catalytic capital. We consider ourselves catalytic capital, but we want to make a difference. We want scale. We want problems, big, big problems being solved. And to do that, you have to have large pools of private commercial capital coming in alongside um, us, right? So to solve the problem, you have to have a lot of capital and so what 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 we try to do is to support you know we do the small funds we do the large projects we do the small projects and we you know do these as sort of um sample or you know just just to prove a concept or to prove a business model and to kind of nurture it with impact investors and with uh, philanthropic organizations to get it to a scale where it can attract other investors. So we, what, so what we try to do is bring in, um, you know, large private investors and to bring those private investors into a, you know, a sector or a country or a region, you have to have returns. They're not coming if you don't have returns, right? And so, so we see our role as not only nurturing the, you know, the, the sort of neat little deals and, you know, the early concepts and willing to do blending, blended finance, you know, doing first loss, capping our upside, um, you know, just basically working with the investors who come in alongside us so that everybody meets their objectives from a risk return perspective. But we also see our role as creating an environment where investors, other investors with large amounts will come in and invest. And once we've done that, we've done our job and we need to go somewhere else and, and you know, replicate that same sort of uh, objective all over again. So in our um, history, you know, there in, in the very early, early days when um, East, East, Eastern Europe and Russia was, you know, still communist, well, it still is, um, you know, at least Russia, right? And, and we needed to, you know, help develop the economies of Eastern Europe, especially after World War II. Um, you know, we came in and we provide, we took significant risk and we provided what I would say is similar to first loss capital, even though we were a lender there, we structured the terms um, and we structure, you know, sort of um, our, our, our entry into the, the fund along with other private institutional investors so that, you know, we limit our upside and we provide it upside to those LPs. And so they were comfortable coming in with, you, you know, with the U.S. government and with also the fact that we left a lot on the table for the other LPs. And so there, there are various ways that we do this. But the overarching goal for us is private, institutional, commercial investors coming into a sector or a deal to solve a development challenge. They do not come in if they don't see a return. Um, so that's, that's sort of the ultimate goal to solve these big problems. But obviously, um, as everyone around the table knows, we also do very small deals and we also do you know, deals as small as I say a hundred thousand dollars into a company or a five, two to five million dollar check into a fund, uh, because we're nurturing ideas and we're nurturing teams and we're developing an ecosystem where one doesn't exist or we're, you know, helping further along the growth of that ecosystem or that team or that, you know, sector or that region. And so um I would say that what Shui Yin say is true. There's a spectrum. Um, depends on what your objectives are. Uh, but in order to move impact investing in a big way, you need returns and you need private capital. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so now maybe moving the conversation to Vietnam. Focus more on Vietnam. Um, this is an open question for all the panelists. What do you think the main opportunities and investing teams for impact investment in 
Vietnam, probably Eddie can start first. Sure. I mean, I think Vietnam as a market uh, is interesting, not for not just for its itself, but also as a, a, a hub of potential innovation across similar markets. So um, it's a very simple graph that folks can probably imagine in their head. If you put GDP per capita on a horizontal axis and you put math and science ability of, of the population on a vertical axis, um, Obviously, Vietnam's on the far left in terms of GDP per capita, uh, but uh, impressively, excuse me, uh, and the, the line of best fit through all the data points will suggest that the wealthier the country, the, the better their math and science performance. That seems to be natural. They have more money to spend on education. Um, on the far end, one would expect some, a country as poor as Vietnam to have pretty poor math and science, but it actually does quite, quite well. It's well above the curve. Uh, and you you go to the you go across the line and you see China is up there, Russia and, and the U.S. All countries very well known for math and science. And what that means in practice for for impact is you have basically a population that is familiar with math and science, a large number of people who can go into engineering, uh, soft software development, and other forms of engineering, and create tech-driven solutions for the problems that they see around them. So uh, it's this very rare nexus in the world, I think, of, of this kind of low income country, well, lower middle income country now, uh, uh, and uh, tech capability elsewhere. So, and, and tech, tech, tech capability. So um, we see a lot of that. And of course, an, uh, a large number of the projects that folks work on are focused on urban, uh, urban vitamins, we'll say. Uh, I mentioned luxury e-commerce. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of other things that, uh, a rising middle class, upper middle class, like to spend money on, like to spend time doing. But, you know, 70 million people in, in Vietnam still live outside the main cities and they're seeing their challenges not fully met yet. Uh, and again, these are around some of the things that I've mentioned before, like education. Uh, I think Xu Yin and Louis both mentioned uh, agric in agriculture. Uh, there's a substantial value extraction uh, along the way thanks to the in current industry structure where uh, the small farmers aren't getting everything that they deserve for what they're producing. Um, healthcare, uh, COVID, Vietnam's doing well with COVID, but if you're, if you're looking beyond uh, public health management, there's still a lot to be seen in terms of delivering quality healthcare to, uh, to much of Vietnam. And so these are things that uh, I'm excited about here in uh, trying to find solutions for here in Vietnam. And if you can solve them here in Vietnam, it's not necessarily solve them for the entire emerging world, but uh, I think there's a likelier, uh, a greater likelihood of these solutions uh, crossing borders than uh, into other emerging markets than say somebody in San Francisco or, or London trying to solve emerging markets health problems. Um, so yeah, that's that's the that's the uh, the way that we're looking things uh, at things here in Vietnam from an investment side. Louis and Shreen, do you have anything to add or? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll share a little bit of what I'm looking at. Um, so um, it's important, I think job creation is very important, uh, particularly in uh, rural areas of Vietnam. Uh, I think uh, we probably are all familiar with the incident, what is it, six, eight months ago, uh, where uh, a lorry uh, was found in the UK uh, with a number of, of Vietnamese villagers um, who, who had tried to seek jobs, essentially. Um, and so um, for me, I think finding opportunities uh, to create jobs, meaningful jobs, a large number of jobs uh, in rural areas like Nghe An, Hà Tinh, um, can be incredibly impactful and it can be very uh, profitable. And I think particularly businesses that can scale. So. When you look out in rural areas like that, oftentimes you're looking at agriculture, uh, very sort of old economy. Um, if you can get something at, uh, if you can get something like that at a fair price, and then you drop some additional capex on top of it with sort of modern technology and bringing in sort of uh, leveling up management, leveling up the technology, uh, I think that could be extremely interesting uh, for not a whole lot of dollars in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but could be impactful. So that's one of the things um, 
I'm looking at. The other is, um, I think that there are a number of companies in Vietnam that are run by incredible entrepreneurs who've gotten to an age where they don't want to work anymore. Uh, and the next generation don't want to be working that hard and I don't blame them. Um, and so a lot of these uh, business owners are looking to exit and they're, they're good companies. They're not necessarily growth oriented, but they, they create a lot, they, they, they maintain a lot of jobs and, uh, and they're profitable. And so uh, the concept that I am exploring is buying one of these companies. And so let's say it's got a 30% profit margin. You take that profit margin, you pay out a third of it as dividends to the investors. You put a third of it back into the business to maintain its, its, its position in the industry and grow it and, and perhaps make it stronger. And you're left with a third that essentially can go back in as a corporate venture fund. And so then it, it creates a perpetual, not a perpetual, it creates a cash flow into a fund that then can have a much longer runway, a much more different perspective on the risk return uh, uh, element because it is a corporate venture fund so you can take on more debt, I mean, you can take on more risk. And so let's say this is an old economy business that's probably got another 10, 15 years on it before it becomes uh, obsolete. If we do a good job of picking the right type of investors, right type of managers, right type of companies, by the time that these companies sunset, you're looking at, you're sitting on a portfolio that could be a meaningful portfolio. Um, so that's a concept that I'm, I'm exploring with a number of, of high net worth individuals, both here in the US and, and in, the, in Asia, where we're picking up, uh, we're exploring picking up um, sort of what they call old economy businesses. Um, and then thirdly, slightly outside of Vietnam, but looking at in Cambodia, um, Viet Cambodia is probably 15 years, 10 years uh, behind Vietnam um, and being able to take uh, some ideas that we have seen work well in Africa in other places in Southeast Asia uh, and then adopting that to, to opportunities in, 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 in Cambodia. Um, Shreen, uh, since I think out of all the panelists, you have the most experience doing impact investing in Vietnam. Uh, what changes in the industry have you observed? Um, yeah, impact investing in Vietnam is, is, is very, it's, it's an interesting topic, right? Because I think if you, just <laughs> like if you look at it, if you Google it or if you look at it on the surface, you'll be like, wait, there's like, who's doing it, right? Um, but I think, so I think in terms of like, you know, officially classified, you know, impact investing, um, I think there's, I, mean, I think the latest gen report said there's actually like very little. And I think like the most, like uh, the majority of it, I think like 90% plus is through DFIs, like the DFC basically, um, mainly going into to kind of larger, larger scale um, investments and, and, and projects. Um, so I think if you look for kind of, um, yeah, explicitly like labeled or classified impact investing in, in Vietnam, uh, you know, there doesn't look like there's much going on. Um, I think the, the reality is though, I mean, I think there's so many businesses, which I think as Louis mentioned, which are having a, a, a strong impact, right? And I think are run by entrepreneurs who are, you know, who, who do have a vision to actually make, you know, lives better for their communities, um, yet that they don't package themselves up as, you know, impact investments, right? Um, and I think that that's probably also another misconception. I think some people expect, um, you know, impact investments to be all, you know, packaged up, wrapped with a tag saying like, hi, I'm an impact investment, please invest in me. But that's, you know, not the case even for us, right? Because I think the, you know, we don't say only invest in social enterprises, for example. I mean, I think that's also a very pretty new concept in, in Vietnam as well. Um, and, you know, I think if we were focused so much on those labels, we actually wouldn't make many <laughs> investments at, at, at all, right? We're actually looking for, you know, what is the, you know, what is the, you know, what is the vision and the intentionality of the entrepreneur? I think that, that is important, right? To have an entrepreneur who said like, oh, I only care about maximizing my financial return. I think that also would be an issue for us, right? But I think we, we're definitely looking for somebody who shares kind of that alignment with us in terms of an impact, right? Even though they might not have necessarily self-identified as a social entrepreneur like explicitly before, right? But they do have that interest in, um, in, 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 you know, improving the lives of their communities or improving healthcare or improving financial inclusion or whatever the case might be. 
Um, so I think it'll take time. It'll take more success stories, right? And um, and I guess people explicitly identifying themselves as both impact investors and um, and or social entrepreneurs, right? To really grow grow the space. But I think um, I would say, yeah, don't. I mean, the the uh, the surface level metrics or statistics statistics look a little um, like low, but I think there's actually a lot more exciting opportunities and you know ways impact investors can. Can operate in, in Vietnam, right? Uh, once they kind of just peel off that um, surface. Um, just follow on your answer. Mm. It's, it's what are the main challenges you've seen in carrying in carrying out impact mm. investing in Vietnam? Is it getting the capital? Is it employing the right people or issues with deal flows, for example? I would say. Um, I actually think, you know, I think Vietnam is a super, I think, I mean, by vibrant market for all the reasons that, that Eddie was saying. Um, I think by the same token, I think for a fund like ours, which targets Series A, Series B investments and has a particular investment thesis that we do, I am glad that we're multi-country, right? I would say it's also probably a little hard for us to deploy the entire $100 million into Vietnam with our very specific investment thesis. Um, so, so, so I think... Uh, so I guess maybe it, it perhaps is then on the, I guess, just pipeline side, right? I'm not, I'm not sure that there's, you know, enough pipeline to support our specific investment thesis, right? Not to say that there's not even, you know, there's not enough you know, opportunities for impact investment in Vietnam, but I mean, obviously we have a very specific thesis, a mandate to fulfill that, you know, only in Vietnam, I think would be a challenge at this point in time. But, uh, you know, but to do that across Southeast Asia, um, I think there's rich pipeline opportunities available. Um, I think the other... Um, I think the other interesting thing that we're giving a lot of thought to these days is that the commercial like investment um, or commercial venture capital scene specifically in Vietnam has really accelerated, right, over the last, let's say, two to three years, like in particular. So, I mean, a lot of, say, money from North Asia, so particularly Korea, Japan, I mean, you know, mon money's flowing in and I think the... Um, just VC events in, in Vietnam now are just always bigger and, and better <laughs> each, each year. Um, and I think, you know, one of the questions we ask ourselves is, you know, how do we maintain that, you know, catalytic and additional nature, right, as we've touched on in earlier parts of, of the call, right? How do we maintain our differentiation um, and be a, still a, a unique and interesting source of capital, right? Because it's not, you know, now with so much competition over deals, right, it's, I think, maybe sometimes not quite accurate to say, like, oh, we're the only investor who would have made that particular deal, right, in that fintech company, which is benefiting financial inclusion. Now, actually, they're like, great, it's serving the, you know, there's many commercial VCs who are also like, great, this is serving the, un, you know, unbanked or underbanked, let's also, like, get in there, right? Um, so I think for us, you know, where we still see we're being kind of, you know, additional or, or catalytic is in the, the mindset that we bring to the table. I think our actual deep experience working with, um, with say, the unbanked or underbanked, um, I think a lot of people are talking about that these days. I mean, it's something we've been doing for the past 20 years, right? So I think there's actually more tangible experience that, that, we, can, that we hope to be able to bring to the table there. Um, but I think that, again, so I think maybe one of the interesting challenges that, that we face is in some ways, lots of capital actually pouring in, and then how do we maintain our kind of unique um, value proposition amongst, amongst all of that? Um, Eddie, do you want to join in or? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, we always hear, the, when, the, when the, this question comes up, often the answer from the investors is not enough deal flow, which is, effectively what she said without, without saying those words. And it's, it's fair. Um, I think uh, in Vietnam in particular, I, I can't speak to the other countries in Southeast Asia as well, but um, the, uh, often a lot of the entrepreneurs who are working on these impactful businesses, uh, not only do they not necessarily think about their business uh, as being an impact business, but um, they may not realize the full full potential of the scale that they could uh, build out their business. And that makes it particularly hard for an investor like Shuyin or myself. We're looking for venture style outcomes, you know, 100x outcomes in the span of several years. Um, whereas, uh, uh, yeah, many of these entrepreneurs are like, okay, yeah, I mean, if in the next few years I, I triple my revenue and I expand to five more provinces or something, that's going to be really successful. And sure, definitely from a, a cash flow basis, uh, you know, a, a lifestyle business, we, we would call it in the VC space, um, that would be uh, a successful path. But uh, so, so part of our work in talking 
with any entrepreneur in Vietnam, but especially with uh, entrepreneurs working on these impact um, kind of angles, products or, or business models, uh, to kind of encourage them to think bigger and then to help them understand more clearly how to get there. So uh, I suppose the hope is that the work that we do at the seed stage um, can help then drive the deal flow for uh, the Patamars of the world for the series A, series B stage. Um, that, so that's just to add a little more color. So it's, it's uh, I think, fortunately it's not that there aren't things to solve here, it's just encouraging the entrepreneurs to, to think bigger about how to solve them. Um, on, in terms of the capital markets piece, uh, yeah, definitely a lot more interest these days than when we launched our Vietnam fund several years ago. Um, but uh, these, these foreign investors are, are less, uh, less familiar with the market. Um, they definitely distort valuations and things like that. And uh, when push comes to shove, they, they can't help on the ground as well as uh, folks who have been on the ground for quite some time. So um, there are, you know, valuation distortion when, when somebody's willing to throw more money at a higher price at a company that, that does create some challenges. Um, but uh, I, I suppose the most, um, the, the more sophisticated entrepreneurs and, and uh, they, they're, they're looking for Kind of strategic value add on top of that capital, and that's when they come to. That's that's when uh, folks like Patamar, five hundred, etc., can still can still win at a at a reasonable terms. So, given the time constraint, this probably will be the last questions for the discussion sections. Um, Louis, you you can provide uh, answer to these questions. Uh, how do small smaller investors and individuals participate or even help to promote impact investing in Vietnam? given your experience as an individual impact investors in the region? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, the U.S. is uh, arguably a deeper market as it relates to impact and, 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 and impact as a, um, a subject and a topic has been around a little bit longer. But even here in the U.S., it's difficult to find Deal, deal, the pipelines and deal flows, that's also a challenge here in the US. So I think that's, that's not particularly a unique thing in Vietnam. Uh, it just impact is new. And to have the ability to have organizations like 500 and Padamar to build the ecosystem where there is a farm team or there is a way to, to mobilize the younger individuals and the younger entrepreneurs to get into this space, I think feeds into that pipeline and it just builds the ecosystem. And that's what, what is being done here in the US to try to develop that pipeline. And so for individuals, I think that, uh, I mean, it depends on your dollar size. I mean, all, all investments has impact, right? I mean, if I buy Exxon tomorrow, I'm making an ex a, a very explicit comment about what I think about the carbon footprint and sort of the environmental situation. If I make an investment in Vena Milk or I make an investment in, um, you know, what I, Philip Morris, you know, that the, there is very uh, meaningful impact behind the dollars that you deploy, deploy as an individual. And so as an individual, whether you invest in companies that you believe, you know, believe in, you buy from local entrepreneurs who you believe in, um, you know, those, that's all, that helps uh, with, with the ecosystem. If you're looking to deploy capital yourself directly, um, I think, again, impact is a very personal thing. And so what you feel hits you in the gut um, and whether you do that as an individual investor is whether you that, do that through one of these great funds, you know, your decision on what you do with your dollars has ramification up and down the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, I think the velocity of money is something that doesn't often get uh, its proper sort of voice in all this. I mean, the more that money flows in the impact space, just the better it is, right? I mean, just, and profit begets talent, which begets profit, and then, that, and then it just grows. Um, and so that velocity is, is extremely important. 
Um, thank you, Louis. I'd probably now open the discussions to the audience. We have received a few Q&A questions and uh, we want to unmute. Uh, Vu, do you want to? Yeah, yeah I, I think we're just gonna go over the, the, the most uploaded ones and the folks who, who want to raise their hand and be brave and talk to the panelists. So the first one is from Dad Huang. Uh, um, you, Dad, I'm gonna unmute you. All right. All right. You unmuted. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um. So hi. My name is Dad Huang. I uh, I am uh, a VP at a com uh, mortgage com commercial real estate mortgage company in New York. I'm also doing uh part time MBA at NYU also in New York. Uh, my questions for the panelists is uh. What are the pathways to break into impact investing? Like what kind of background do you look for in a candidate? Um, do you look for investment banking background or general finance background? Or do you look for like nonprofit background? Which one do you prefer? Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's, it's mainly if you want to go into the business of in investing, whether it's impact or otherwise, I think you need that investment uh, banking background, especially if you want to go into private equity, right? You have to be able to do uh, mergers and acquisition um, tra transactions. Um, and it depends on, you know, whether you want to do it in, you know, in emerging market country in Vietnam or in other areas uh, and other regions. So, but I would say in general, if you want to do deals and transactions, you need an investment banking background. Um, if you want to go into impact investing from a policy or an ESG basis, then maybe the sciences, if you are looking at the environment, um, or, you know, policy regarding labor, um, you know, human rights, et cetera. So it, it, it depends on whether you want to be on the business side or on the policy side. Or, and it also depends on whether you want to do legal work uh, with, uh, with respect to these types of transactions. Um, so um, you're in New York, right? And it sounds like you are doing an MBA, if, if I heard correctly. Yes. Um, I, I, yeah, I would encourage you to, you know, go into one of the larger financial institutions and really, you know, put your, um, uh, your, your, your education and hours on doing uh, transactions and or supporting, you know, some senior account officers with deals. Uh, if, if you want to go towards the business side. Um, I think probably uh, Louis and, and, and Eddie, you know, there, there are other options, right? You could go out and be an entrepreneur and you could, you know, be an investor or you could start your own business. I mean, I think you guys are probably the, the generations Z and Y and X. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little older, so I have the more traditional path, but I think uh, the younger generation um, ha or the younger generations have different paths. And I think your, your outlook on life is also different. And so um, being an, an entrepreneur like Louis or, or Eddie is, is, you know, is something to consider as well. You know, being an investor versus, you know, doing transaction and using other people's money to invest um, is, is, you know, so there are many options for you, but it does, uh, it does uh, start with, you know, a good education and sort of a good, uh, well-rounded understanding of the world. So if I can share a little bit, so my, so I'm going to give a little bit about my background because it's going to inform where my opinion's coming from. So I started out as an investment banker in Tokyo. Uh, and then I became a fund manager for uh, a public equity fund uh, running uh, Tap Hartley and public money. Um, and then from there, I became a private equity investor. Uh, and so I arrived in the impact space about maybe 10 years ago uh, from a personal uh, sort of wake up one day. And so I find 
my training in investments, uh, I have a CFA, which is very, you know, deep in the traditional investment uh, knowledge base, which I think is all wrong, because when you go into impact, all that has to go out the window. But it gives me the language to speak to those who aren't, who hasn't drank the, who have not drank the Kool-Aid yet in, in, uh, for impact. And so as a chief investment officer, um, I have to be able to speak to our investors as to why we did a deal supporting a uh, foster care agency, why that makes sense from a debt, from a risk return perspective, and why that impact is meaningful. And so the first part of that I can speak to on the investment side, because that's my training. I stumble a little bit when it comes to talking about the impact side and why uh, in the language that, that, that is meaningful in, in the impact space, because I, I, I haven't been trained academically or professionally for a long time in that space. And so I lean on my colleagues who are much more academically trained in the impact world to be able to give me the, the wordings and the context and, and the precedence to be able to make the case. Um, and so to Lynn's point, I think the very first decision note is, where do you want to be? Do you want to be sort of in the trenches doing these great, you know, sort of startups that, that are solving the world's problem? Are you an asset allocator where you are sitting at a foundation? Um, um, or are you um, government side, private side? Is it like, where's your, where does it speak to you? And I think the one thing that Lynn brought up, which I really agree with is, is, is a legal background. I think we, there are so many things I wanna do as an investor to, because I want to be, be uh, creative and, and, and solve the, the impact investment entrepreneur. Uh, but when it comes to the legal side of things, it becomes a real difficulty. And so having a legal background, girls please. If you have a legal background, then it really helps solve some of those issues. <laughs> Thank you. Eddie, hey, your turn. To say. Okay, say bye. Bye. I think, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to move on to the next question so we can uh, thank you that for um, the thought. Sorry, we, we have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to go over all of them. Uh, the next one is from Christopher Day. Uh, Are right, you unmuted? Hello. Hello? Hello. Yes, hello, I'm here. Yep, go ahead with your question. Okay, great. Thank and, uh, you. And introduce yourself, I guess. Yeah, so, so my name is, uh, is Chris. I am based in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, and I am running commercial operations for an early stage venture here that is gearing up for pre Series A fundraising uh, this year. We operate in the space of technical and vocational education. Um, company was founded and continues to run really as a purely commercial operation. Uh, and those are sort of certainly at the forefront of what I'm doing on a daily basis is trying to run a business and build a fundraising narrative and a growth story, et cetera. Um, but really at the core of, of what we're doing, um, not only by nature of the space, but also the vision of the founder, we are an impact company. Uh, the, the career outcomes that we produce for students are, you know, in many cases life-changing and there's an obvious um, increase in income, both immediately after completing the training, but also more importantly on the trajectory long-term in terms of lifetime earnings, uh, as well as sort of the founder has a, has a particular um, commitment to closing the gender gap in STEM careers. So I, I think related to what Shu Yim was talking earlier about, I mean, the, the, the breadth of our impact is probably fairly modest, but the depth is really quite deep. And so, my question is related to, um, I want to gear my fundraising efforts. I want to secure um, a lead investor from an impact fund this year, uh, mostly for the reasons of strategic alignment. And I'm kind of trying to define what are going to be the core variables that we track and measure to communicate our story. But I'm really nervous about um, 
engaging with a number of investors on the impact front and having everyone kind of come at me with their unique angles on what impact they want to focus on and me going back and you know kind of routinely going back to the drawing board and, and trying to define new variables to meet everyone's um, mandate. So I'm really, I'm, I'm hoping for some advice on how to go about collecting a very small number of core metrics that I will track alongside all of the routine metrics like customer acquisition and growth and revenues and things like that. Shuin, do you want to take this question? Uh, yeah, d definitely. Um, I, I think it sounds like you already know, like in, in your heart, right? Um, what what your core metric should should be, right? And I think I know nothing about your business um, apart from what you just said, but uh, but it sounds like the core outcomes are really around, um, you know, the, the education slash career outcomes, um, and then I think potentially something around um, and and like gender integrated into that as well, right? And I I think it's about kind of sticking to your knitting in terms of. Uh, you know, in, in terms of like spelling that out, right? Just the same way that you, um, you know, articulate your your competitive advantage in the market, right? Or any other kind of more financial aspect or business aspect um, of, of what you're doing. Um, I think you have to kind of be true to true to who you, what, what what the organization is and, and the vision of the founders, as you say. Um, and then I think then the next step is to actually research like which or who are the impact investors who actually, you know, where that fits, right? Um, just the same way you would do like, oh, okay, this VC, it's only investment series A, it's not gonna, we're gonna be too early or whatever, right? So I think just the same way, we always give the advice, you know, do your homework on, on potential investors. I think the same thing goes for impact investors as well. It's just that additional aspect of like, okay, what impact themes are they focused on? And, and broadly, would I, would I fit, right? Um, so, so I think rather than trying to um, cram yourself too much into uh, investors, um, you know, boxes, uh, you know, I think just state clearly kind of who, who you are. And I think find an investor who shares that, that alignment and vision. And uh, if I may add, uh, a lot of the impact investors in the region are actually quite patient to, to talk through and, and, you know, they, they, they want to respect the vision of the entrepreneur uh, in terms of what the impact is and how to track it. Uh, but also uh, I, I, I think kind of making your job easier if you can make sure you tell your commercial story very clearly and um, compellingly, that short circuits a lot of the, the concerns about, uh, I mean, you, you convince them on the commercial side and then they'll work with you on the impact side, no problem. So talk about your unit economics, talk about how can you um, scale very efficiently and effectively, mm -hmm. think about how is your, your business really different um, from what anybody else could set up. Um, if you, if you answer those questions well, they'll work with you through the rest. Uh, I happen to know, I, I looked LinkedIn you as you were talking, so uh, you can say hi to your, your, your uh, the founder for me. Uh, we've had a conversation before. Uh, I really like the work you guys are doing. Great, thanks Eddie. Right. And I would also we'll just add, um, I, I would also just add just one thing. Um, think about the type of investors um, or the type of, uh, the types of investor you, want to attract, right? I, I mean, as you build your business, who do you want to be your partners? You know, who are they? Who are your, you know, the people who are going to help you grow? Who, who, who are the investors who are going to help you with your vision and your growth? I mean, really think about that because these are long-term partnerships. It's like a marriage, right? Sometimes, Sometimes these investments make last longer than marriages. This is the truth. Yeah, <laughs> no, but um, yeah, these are yeah, especially in our business, you stop ten years, and uh, yeah, you got to work things out. You can't just walk away. Um, so think about. So I, I I think who your partners are, and those include investors, is very important. Thanks, Lynn. Um, the next question is from. Nam Phuong Duan, uh, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi everyone, Hello? can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for your insights. I think it's the first time that I've been in a conversation um, about impact investing in Vietnam. Um, so I'm Nam and I'm currently a graduate student at Parsons School of Design in New York City. And I previously worked in um, impact investing, but specifically for a creative economy at a place called Upstart CoLab in New York City. 
So my question is, um, you know, has impact investing in the creative economy been on your radar? You know, Louis, I know that you talked a little bit about this um, in film. Um, and how can impact investing be deployed as one way to support creative projects and creative people in Vietnam and emerging markets? And I'm thinking about creative economy uh, broadly defined from fine arts to design to handcraft and sustainable food. Thank you. Yeah, I would, uh, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, the intellectual um, dexterity and creative dexterity that's required in the creative space takes a lot of training. Um, and one of, the, one of the problems that we face in the film business is the younger people are arguably a lot more creative and daring than some of the older uh, scripts, uh, screenwriters and directors. And so finding ways to elevate that talent uh, up is um, incredibly difficult, um, although it seems very um, sort of self-evident. So I think in the, in the creative space, it's something I've looked at actually. Um, and I think it's intriguing because it also has a lot of export capability, particularly in Vietnam, if I'm speaking in Vietnam. Um, and, you know, uh, where that is a, a, a value added to that, that business model. But there are a number of uh, clothing store, clothing brands in the U.S. that started out uh, representing a community, right? I mean, back in the days where you have uh, FUBU, right? For us, by us, uh, an African-American brand really designed for that community that became tremendously successful uh not necessarily high design or high fashion but there was a lot of risk taking involved in in that kind of design and so personally i'm i'm intrigued by it um i haven't seen uh many of those deal flows in vietnam uh but you know whatever it is that you're doing in new york to kind of get your um your training I think uh, that I think is a is part of what I would saw call it the technology transfer, bringing that training and bringing that that creativity uh, and injecting that into the local community. And I, there are plenty of ways to be able to be profitable with that. I'm not sure if I answer your right. question. Uh, we can move on to the next question. Uh, from Claire Tran. Say, uh, hello. Oh, hi. Oh. Hey, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Claire Tran. I'm currently a senior at Temple University in Philadelphia, uh, US. Um, thank you for the great discussion. Um, my question to you is um, a bit on the macro level. So, in what ways do you think the current government policies in developing countries do or do not support uh, impact investing? Thank you. Um, maybe I can just broadly take that one. Uh, uh, it, it depends on the country. Um, I, I can't really speak to Vietnam. I, I don't have the granularity and the direct, you know, uh, in equity investments that uh, Shu Yang or, or Eddie or Louis may have. Um, so they maybe can address it from a Vietnam perspective. Uh, but from, you know, an emerging market perspective, um, you know, it depends on the country, right? I mean, when we go into an investment in a country, we look at the you know, regulatory framework. We look at the, um, you, you know, how 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 the courts have have addressed, you know, in, investors' rights from a lender perspective. We look at, you know, precedent uh, transactions, and when those transactions run into issues, you know, how has the local government treated it? We look at the tax treaty. We look at, I, I you you know. It depends, right? It depends on the country. It depends on the legal system. Is it UK? Is it, you know, something else? Is it UAE, Mauritius, et cetera? So it's very complex. 
there's not really an answer uh, that would address all of that. It depends on the jurisdiction. And so I think you will have to, um, you know, wait for an answer potentially from Shui Yang and from Eddie uh, with respect to Vietnam specifically, since they've done the investment, they've gone through the cycle and they know in terms of the legal due diligence, commercial due diligence and all of that, they can probably speak to that a lot better. Shuyin, do you want to go? So, oh, or is Louis going to go? <laughs> um, I would just add the, the um, inefficiencies uh, as it relates to the investment regulation, not inefficiency, but the obstacles and barriers um, makes it a little difficult to do certain deals. Um, and so, for example, in the film business, uh, when you make, uh, when you do uh, a film, um, if you're an out, if you're a foreign investor, you have to go through what's called a BCC, a uh, business cooperation contract, which is real pain. Um, and so to make it worthwhile, no one's going to take anything less than $200,000. Um, I have a Singaporean film producer who, uh, owns a chain of, uh, theaters in Singapore, but he, he wants us to come in for a hundred thousand so that he can understand the market better before he puts in 200, 300, a million dollars, totally reasonable and smart. But because of these barriers, it makes it difficult for him to, 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 uh, to take those baby steps. And so he goes to Thailand because he can take baby steps. Um, and so when we have inefficiencies like that and obstacles like that, we end up pushing money away to, to other countries. Yeah. I'll uh, add on just a couple of specifics here for Vietnam uh, that, uh, and this is specifically around tech, uh, tech oriented impact companies, uh, that there are a lot of regulations that have improved a lot over the last few decades here in Vietnam, but uh, still have a way to go. So as an example, I mean, Louis referenced the foreign investment thing in the context of film, but actually uh, there, there's a foreign investment uh, approval process that affects basically every kind of business. And on paper, it's supposed to take just a couple of weeks, but depending on the business, the, the age of the company and a variety of other factors, it can still take six to 12 months to approve uh, for an investment, especially for later stage companies. Um, there are specific industries around uh, impact uh, that are more heavily regulated as they should be, but it does make it more challenging to invest. So things around financial services, around healthcare, and, and even uh, rice, the rice industry is a protected industry here. Um, it makes it harder to uh, move money quickly to uh, uh, early stage entrepreneurs when they might need it the most. Uh, all that said, yeah, so the regulations have been evolving in a generally positive direction. And uh, perhaps most importantly here, the government's been very vocally supportive of impact from both a, of, of, of uh, tech investment from both a conventional um, tech startup angle as well as an impact angle. Uh, there was a conference around the role of tech and innovation uh, for so socioeconomic development here in Vietnam. Uh, I think that was uh, almost a year ago now uh, where they invited not just uh, NGO leaders and impact investors, but also folks, more, more traditional investors and, and, uh, and uh, other leaders to, to come and speak about this. And this was um, the participants included the prime minister of Vietnam, heads of various ministries and so on. So, um, you know, on, on one hand, talking isn't the same as doing, but uh, on the other hand, th this kind of endorsement really encourages activity and action from both the entrepreneur side as well as the investor side. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, one, uh, the, we have room for one last question from Hua Chuan. Hua, well, hello. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Kwa, currently a junior in Brigham Young University uh, based in uh, Silicon Slope in Utah. So I have questions. Uh, to Eddie and Shirin. So as you mentioned about the uh, limited pipeline of ventures in Vietnam, as well as the increasing high interest and heavy inflow of capital. So how, so what is your take on the um, competitive landscape between venture capital firms in Vietnam? Is it uh, a collaborative uh, environment or how would um, the firms source deals between themselves? Thank you. 
Uh, I would say it's a mix. It depends on the players and, and the kinds of deals, but uh, uh, I would say the market has been generally, uh, it's, it's still very much uh, emerging and uh, a lot of the new entrants are still getting familiar with it. So there's a lot more collaboration than not. Um, we don't see the same elbow throwing uh, as much as in Silicon Valley where literally firms will block out other firms, won't allow participation and so on. A specific example of this is there's actually a, a WhatsApp group of, of uh, these younger VCs um, that in, in terms of age, they, they have uh, you know, their associates and uh, junior principals at uh, different firms here. Um, they uh, have a WhatsApp group, they have a regular call or lunch meetup to discuss deals and things like that. Uh, of course, all the partners that are involved in deals in Vietnam, uh, we all have each other on WhatsApp and so on, and we share relevant deals when they come up. Um, that said, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes down to chasing down a good opportunity, you know, you want to be, you want to be, you want to move fast, you want to kind of figure out quickly whether uh, it's the right fit for your firm, uh, and, and make sure you are in there because the space is not unlimited uh, in, in, in each of these rounds. So that's where um, the, the VCs that, the, the few VCs that actually have people on the ground have an edge um, to, to uh, develop, to, to surface opportunities and develop the relationships more deeply over time than those who just fly in and out every quarter or every year. Um, I guess they're, they're not even being able to fly, they're not even able to fly in and out right now. So uh, uh, for the time being, the, 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 there are, there's still differentiation. There's still meaningful, um, still meaningful uh, advantage among the folks who have been more committed here for a longer period of time. Um, and, and so we can, we can go ahead and, and find and, and get into these opportunities. Um, the last point I would say is that uh, the VC landscape, the competitive landscape can't be looked at all in one piece. It's uh, obviously at different stages. Um, uh, and and it, so, so at the seed stage, the committed dynamic looks a certain way. The, the A and B stage looks another way. Um, I, I'll leave the comments to uh, on the series A and B to shoo in, I guess. But on the seed stage, it's, it's still very much uh, just a small handful of investors who are, um, who are really frequently looking at companies here, making more than one or two deals a year here. Um, so uh, I would say we're probably uh, the most collaborative on the spectrum of, of the, the VC trajectory um, and especially the impact VC trajectory. Shuyin, uh, do you want to speak about the A and B if it comes there? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think the, the only thing that I, I really like to add is, you know, I think sometimes people assume that as an impact investing firm, we might only collaborate with other, um, other impact investors. But I think in, in Vietnam, that would be a very lonely, lonely thing to do. Um, so it's actually very active uh, collaboration between, you know, ourselves and I think, you know, the likes of 500 and others. And um, I would actually like to quite, uh, proudly give a shout out to my colleague, I think Yen, who's on the call, who actually founded the, the young VC group that Eddie mentioned. So, um, so I think we're, we're definitely part of the same kind of collaborative ecosystem um, and it's, it's a small it's a small world right so I think you know reputation and um, is, is very important uh, as, as, as always so I think um, you know I think being a good team player in, in, in this small ecosystem that we have is, is so important thank you and that's the end of our webinar thank you so much for joining in and a big thank you to our panelists for their insights um, please monitor we have our Facebook page for any update from us thank you so much Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much to VFS for hosting. Thanks, everyone.